we work on correlative microscopy and spectroscopy. We create complex 3D nanostructures of organic and inorganic nature, and we use microscopy to investigate those. I come from the Helmholtz Center in Berlin, and essentially we're operating uh, two big sources, do neutron research and um, work with synchrotrons, but also we work on the big challenges of mankind because we deal about materials and structures and devices to contribute to our energy system. So that's basically where we are from and how I get to this conference, I hope I can explain in a minute. So we create materials um, which are energy efficient, which are um, nanostructures for thin film solar cells or solid state lighting or solar fuel devices. So it's all about complex 3D nano architectures. And this we do in part of our group, which is called the Nano Architecture Studio. So we can do a lot of things with vapor phase deposition and that sort of physical techniques ourselves. But then everything is nano, so to improve and optimize those materials, we need a very good correlative microscopy and spectroscopy. And that's where we have an interface. And um, we brought up a pretty nice lab with that, and we are lucky to also be part of the lab at location community of Zeiss company because we can't have all the nice microscope ourselves. So this lab at location group of um, um, of people and institutions, we can get access to additional microscopes. And why this is worth it, um, you will also learn throughout the talk. So lab at location, just one word. Um, this is if there are novel machines or novel applications or new levels of complexity. Yeah, it's maybe good uh, as an industrial manufacturer to collaborate with institutes to get like application notes or talks or papers or just simple people that get more scientific cases uh, to these new machines. So that's um, how we collaborate and that's um, um, where we think we should contribute. So then we should not only um, do some solar cells or some, some electrodes, um, that's why we also do additional materials yeah, like which are of socioeconomic relevance yeah, from the um, IT field, from all sorts of nanoelectronics, optoelectronics, but also then from um, areas of um, life science and biotechnology. All of that can be created here or, can, or we get through collaborations and should be investigated with very good, very, very good microscopy. So we have some of the latest machines here in uh, Berlin at the Helmholtz Center, but these are off-the-shelf microscopes. So if you buy those, everybody can buy them and you can use them and do very good uh, microscopy. We also created additional uh, machines in collaboration. In the beginning, not with size. This was a um, chat manufacturer where in an EU project which stopped last year, we try to do really good correlation and put almost everything to one machine and see how far we get. <laughs> and eventually, this thing was really manufactured. You can see it in Bruno in a Tescan company. And it has some disadvantages. Even so, it's called the Swiss knife of nanoscience. Swiss knife of nanoscience has some disadvantages. We have huge lever arms. So basically, resolution really deteriorates the more things you put to the machine. And then secondly, not everything works at its optimum because it's pretty crowded in those machines. Yeah? And then eventually, we could demonstrate a few things, but this is not the smartest thing to do to throw everything on one machine. And therefore now we, we want to step one, one step back and maybe correlate certain things, but in a smarter way. And we try to do this now together with size and I will show you what we have in planning. <clears throat> so this is how it looks inside. It's pretty crowded, but we have like, um, we have like mass spectrometry, we have optics in our SM, SEM chambers, yeah, so we can do Raman spectroscopy and fluorescence and everything like correlated with the SEM imaging or with the FIP imaging, which is also available. And we can shed light in there, and sometimes it's really important, and I also show you some examples where we were using this. But um, 
yeah, so these are the conventional things, and I think right now um, we have come to a new era of electron microscopy because here are the huge um, data factories yeah, that crank out data like crazy, and we saw this yesterday and today um, that here we produce really a lot. So the question is how to really get all this data correlated and make efficient use of this and also handle the entire thing. And we were viewing this, and I apologize, this is German, I just overlooked it somehow. Um, but you can see um, it's a data funnel, and here you create um, a lot of data. We view it like this. So first, for the first time with this XRM and MSIM, we can uh, create something like find the needle in the haystack and really um, monitor large volumes of a material. And once you found the needle, then you may have additional um, techniques which are all available. Yeah? And I showed you some SEMs with correlated data. Once you have the needle, you can do all these specific spectroscopies. So if you compare like years before and today, we were always doing the second step before the first one, because before these techniques existed, we were always like hunting for a needle and sometimes we found and sometimes we didn't. Now we can really scan this and do it the right way, one after the other. Find the needle in the haystack, do the specific things, and then data funnel, find these things you want to investigate on this needle, like sometimes it's only a number or it's a fit parameter or something. Extract the important thing from your data. And I think this is the biggest challenge to always find the things you want to extract and then do it correctly. And I will show you some examples of how we did it and where we did it. So these are the specialized techniques and you've seen them before. So when we talk about correlative microscopy for a lot of inorganic samples, and I will show you basically nothing because I think the community is very different. We want to do a lot of um, electrical, optical properties, topographic, structural, um, crystallographic. Very often in, in life science samples, this is not so, so important. But we do this by combining electrons, ions, probes, and, and photons, and correlate those techniques. And then there's a wealth of different techniques, all these acronyms, where basically you can combine a few techniques and learn this additional bit of information, physical information about the sample. And, but then you have a lot of heterogeneous data. Yeah? You need some data structuring and data minimizing <laughs> techniques, and I think right now there are, there are certain answers, but a lot has to be done, especially in this respect. So here you see where we have like the big lever arm, the optics in our scanning electron microscope. And there's also some, um, some pick and place and, um, and AFM probe technology inside this SEM. Um, so I, I told you we plan to do something smarter with this, and luckily Zeiss has developed like a door which can be removed from the microscope, like the Merlin microscope. And then basically you can have more doors with different functionality and all these things which are cramped here together, you could put, put on individual doors. And then only use the technique you wanna use today or for this sample and all the other functionalities are sitting in their pumped houses and wait that we use them. So therefore, um, this is pretty smart and then also um, you don't have like all these mechanical vibrations which can be caught by big lever arms like this. And um, I thought, we thought this is a very good idea and we tried and this is something we have already. This is an AFM sitting on one of those doors. We, put additional pick and place techniques now on additional doors um, and do also some optics on even other doors. And there are smaller companies that also collaborate with size in this endeavor. And uh, here are even other companies, some of them we've seen before, to do the optics in those doors. And to do, let's learn something, what we do about the pick and place and nanomanipulation on 
those doors. Right now, it's still sitting not on a door, but on a chamber, but we will move this on a door sometime soon. So we have an AFM here and in um, a scanning electron microscope. And the difference is that this is uh, controlled by a haptic device. Yeah? So a student in our group produced this. So this is real-time image. So you can flip between those tables. And with the pick and place, you can pick like little particles, whatever you have in mind. We also have grippers, you put them. And then here's a gold flake and this is a silver particle and you put them together. And once you have an ensemble, it has a very distinct optical answer and optical properties. This is something like hardcore nano-optics guys are interested in getting things like this. You may not be interested in getting ensembles like this, but maybe you have other ideas, so that's why I show it to you. What you could in principle do with like having two arms here that can be operated like two arms and hands and do nano-manipulation. Um, something like this, we created like some little hand like this and these are uh, silver nanowires and we maneuver them over contact and they measure electrical properties. I bet you're not interested in electrical properties, but maybe you have other things in mind. What one could do with some grippers and hands and fingers, um, nano fingers like this. So we maneuver this thing with a haptic device, you know, from your PlayStation. And then we can do like pick and place those things and create ensembles, which we have in mind. Again, for the nano optics guys, very exciting. And, but if we have like particles like this, and if we have like analytics like that, then we can have like optical spectra like this, which can be very defined. So inspire yourself whether you have something in mind that can profit from, from a technology like this. This can sit and live on such a door in a size microscope. So a few words about the optics. We create also LED, nano LED structures, nano wires, and with like the Delmic angular resolved cathode luminescence, we can tell where on those nanostructures is which type of life, light from. For the optics guys, again, very interesting. We can grow those things in big uh, CBD machines. And uh, then some people like Osram and, uh, and Cryonano, these guys are really interested in improving the technology of LEDs and lasers. Um, but also these cathode luminescence, maybe for other materials, is as important as for this inorganic stuff. And then we have Raman spectroscopy, and there we again learn something about samples. But I think in particular Raman is very important also in the life science, so what, that's why I tell a few more words about this. So you have a molecule, it has vibrations, and it has vibrational modes. Energy-wise, they are compared to electronic levels here at the lower energy side, but they're very distinct. And they are fingerprints of the structure itself. And so you can have excite all with the laser, all sorts of vibrations, and they are characteristic for a certain molecule. So this is a very easy example of a CH2 group in a molecule. So this is something you can monitor with Raman. So basically, you excite to a virtual level, yeah, and then, um, then going back to a ground state or to a certain excited state, we get distinct um, um, Raman scattered light. And this is characteristic for molecules and materials. And then this is a setup. Then you can map here with, with XY stages, with the precision of a piezo stage, which can be as good as 10 nanometers. And then you move here on your sample and get spectrum after spectrum and get a mapping. Um, of this Raman, um, Raman scattering of your sample. And this is how it looks like. Yeah, we have like different lasers at hand and these are the spectrometers. And we were fitting this, um, feeding this fiber couple through our microscope. So basically within our SEM, we can use the Raman spectrometry. 
and how we make use of this for real world samples. So together with um, medical doctors at the University of Erlangen, they're interested in bone research and osteoporosis research, that sort of things. We took a look at a human bone. It has certain, um, certain areas in this optical microscope which are either um, osteocytes or filled with acellular material, some crystalline material, which is indicative of either a disease or something's going wrong. And I don't want to go into deeper into this because I have, this is very far from my area of expertise. But in an SEM, we can find those areas. Yeah? And some, these ones here are filled with this acellular material. And we can fib cut it and then we can see, okay, these pearl-like structures are filled. And if we go to a Raman spectrum, we can see that these lacunae, which are filled with this acellular material, and those of the surrounding bone material, they, this is this red and this green peaks, they are very different, especially the ratios of the peaks are different. Even so, maybe the positions are identical. And then we go to some characteristic ones, and then we can really see in Raman, and which is a fastly scanning optical technique, um, those areas which are filled with this acellular material being indicative um, of a disease or something um, like an injury um, in the bones. Then we work again with this combination of Raman spectroscopy and microscopy together with people um, in the um, that are interested in um, renal research. And this is an optical microscope of a healthy um, kidney and of a kidney which has some um, amyloidosis, which they explain to me is something like a um, disease similar to Alzheimer, but uh, not for the brain, but for the kidney. So you find those structures if you stain them. Um, but you can also find them in a distinct signature in Raman spectroscopy. And here you see your healthy control sample. And here you see the sample with the amyloidosis. And you see this is a much richer landscape of peaks. Yeah? And this, this one here um, is different. You can really distinguish. So now we went into papers seeing which of the peaks we can index. And we already realized that not all the peaks are in those lists of frequency lists of known vibrational modes, but we tried to index a few, and then we realized, okay, we can index a few more. These are all recent papers after 2010, so this is the Rama technique now in correlation with other techniques, it's just picking up in this type of research, but then there are a few that, which are not indexed, and these must be somehow indicative for the, the disease. So this is now really ongoing research that we think we have to exhaust the Raman in combination um, with other spectroscopy technique, uh, microscopy and spectroscopy techniques a bit more to really make use of this um, label-free fingerprinting which Raman can give us. And this is an, an example also from the literature where they were also doing Raman um, microscopy, um, indexing a lot of peaks. In the research, um, brain research, where they classified Alzheimer's disease and compared to healthy individuals. And by taking a look here at this rich landscape of Raman peaks and doing principal component analysis, which means they were looking for those which are different in a healthy versus a diseased um, tissue, they could have a very good um, separation um, of, of the different individuals through the Raman signatures. So I think right now in, we get more samples of the people um, doing that type of, type of tissue research and we exhaust Raman spectroscopy in combination with microscopy if needed and where needed. So um, in the end, a few words about using X-ray microscopy on that tissues, and there again we take a look at the bones. Uh, we have already seen what we can do with spectroscopy there. This is an use of an X-ray microscope, and this is an osteoporotic mouse bone. 
And there's a very nice high resolution data we can, could extract from this um, X-ray machine Versa. And we compared, we took these huge data sets and we were seeing that some vessels in a resolution where the medical doctors were saying they have never seen before. You can see these vessels in your, in your um, bones. And then we compare like healthy mice and um, osteoporotic mice. And you see all these features, uh, like here, these vessels uh, that, that go from the inside to the outside of the bone. And then we, you see here these trabecula. And you see in a healthy mouse, this is a much richer um, network of trabecula compared to this osteoporotic mouse. And then again, you take a look here at the vessels and you can see that here in the center you have much more distribution of different sizes of those um, vessels. So this is something we were using. Uh, we, we used a lot of these uh, plugins already known from 2D materials research and we are now using it on the 3D data um, from ImageJ and Fiji and we thought like it's a very, very good and easy use for that type of data. And right now we are working together with these medical doctors to interpret all these results. And here's another, and then I guess time is running out, so I will be finished with the next slide. Here you see again a bone where color-coded, you see here some bluish and greenish area, which people tell that this is the starting to grow bone, whereas the red and whitish, it's uh, areas of higher density. So this is the bone itself. And here this greenish and bluish um, carpet on top of this bone is the starting, uh, the, the bone which starts to grow. And those are the areas where the bone is removed. So people, uh, medical people are saying, this is something they have never seen um, in this resolution before. And we can take now 2D stacks of that data, seeing here the area where the bone starts to grow, and which is a, a little bit different in the gray level compared to the already finished bone, which is here the brighter area. And now to compare what people had before, um, they were doing staining and fluorescence microscopy, and there also in the red part you see where the bone starts to grow, but here you have one shot and one slice. So now with this XRM 3D image, you are much better. You have like um, TIFF stacks, and you, you, you um, can go through the entire bone looking and hunting for those areas which are interesting. And there we are back to this picture of funneling of data. You, you hunt for the needle in the haystack and then you take a look and um, find interesting things. And I think much more interesting things are out there to come. And so I hope I could convince you that these are like data factories, which are new, and I think interesting things will have to come here. Um, additional data, we can always add to this type of data, and now everything will uh, critically depend on those people handling the data and coming up with good algorithms, um, data narrowing strategies um, um, in this correlative microscopy spectroscopy research. Thanks for your attention.